what can economics lecturers do? Well, a, one, one observation, I think, is, is to constantly try to make the real-world connection. Uh, so what you're teaching, the, the equations you're putting up on the, the board, the, the supply and demand curves you're drawing, to make the connection between that and reality. Now, what does this tell us? It must tell us something about something. And, it, and it, sometimes it's so obvious to us that we, that we don't notice. I remember my economics teacher in, uh, I think, probably a revision class um, for our end of, end of term, end of our first term exams, drawing a, a supply and demand curve, and then just and showing what would happen if you put a price floor that was above the equilibrium price. Uh, and it's pretty easy, so, you know, there you go, you've got, you've got a, a large quantity supplied and a small quantity demanded, and so you have a big surplus. And he just drew that, and then he said, that's the EU wine lake. And it was I mean, it didn't take very much. This was in the early 90s, of course. They go, oh, right, yeah, I see. That, those stupid curves you keep drawing actually refer to some important thing that's happening in the real world. And that, that, that I think, is the central thing. And if you're, if you're teaching something and you can't make the connection between what you're putting on the blackboard and the real world, well, we all have a problem, haven't we, at that point? And I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are times when that happens, but you know, we, we, we need to keep trying to do that. Um, the other thing I'd say is, is uh, there are now quite a lot of books on the market. They've been coming out since about the mid-1990s. Um, pop- and there are a few that are even earlier than that. Popularizing economics. And by now, pretty much any economic idea you could possibly want to explain has been explained with some very uh, cool and inventive analogy. So you have David Friedman, Milton Friedman's son, with it explaining that there are, there are two ways to... Um, two ways for Americans to make cars. You know, they can manufacture them in Detroit or they can grow them in Iowa. If you want to grow them in Iowa, you first you grow corn, then you put the uh, corn on a ship, then you send the ship out to a, a futuristic biofactory off the coast of Hawaii, and the futuristic biofactory turns the corn into Toyotas. They come back <laughs> and... Um, and, you know, and, and there you go. And those are, the, those are the two ways that Americans can make cars. And then, of course, he reveals actually the biofactories is called Japan. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's 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 a really great way, a really great way of understanding uh, the way that oh yeah, the, uh, the trade tariff um, that's supposed to protect one industry can actually hurt another industry. So you, you put a tariff on imports of cars, and what you're really saying is we don't like. Americans making cars by growing them in Iowa. We don't, we don't like that. We want Americans to make cars by making them in Detroit. And that's the right way to make cars. You start to understand the effect of that, of that sort of policy. And there are so many of these books out there. They're all in the paperback these days. They're all quite cheap. I recommend grabbing a bunch and reading. Because I, whenever, whenever I read one of them, I, I, I learn something. And you, you might learn something that you can adapt for, for your own use. <laughs>